What's up everybody, Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. Hey, question for you. Are denominations good or bad? Are they great? Are they evil? What's the deal with all of the various Protestant denominations? There's so many of them. In fact, really, when you hear criticisms about Christian denominations, Protestant denominations, it really kind of comes from two camps, which tend to make some strange bedfellows. On one hand, You'll very often hear this kind of accusatory language about Protestant denominations from Roman Catholics. Now, we might expect to hear it from Roman Catholics. After all, they would accuse us of fracturing the body of Christ. Uh, they would say that we've taken what is unified and whole in Christendom and we've scattered it into a million pieces like shattering a mirror on the ground. Catholics will often tell you that Protestants are guilty of the sin of schism. In fact, that we have uh, broken the body and that thousands, even tens of thousands of different strands of of Christianity. And of course, um, they will say that there's no agreements even between all those various Protestant denominations. One of the things that they would find us most guilty of is trying to interpret the Bible, quote, for ourselves, which they would say leads into all sorts of errors and doctrinal uh, heterodoxies and uh, false teachings and things like that. And so the Roman Catholics will accuse Protestant denominations of being guilty of schism and, in fact, um, violating that incredibly important text in John chapter 17, verse 21, where Jesus is praying before the Father, that high priestly prayer, we call it, and he prays that they may all be one. Christ prays that all of his church would be one. And so Catholics would say that Protestants are guilty of breaking up the body of Christ into thousands of pieces. Now, interestingly, the kind of strange bedfellows um, situations that you'll often hear this also from non-denominational fundamentalist independent churches too who otherwise don't have a whole lot in common with Roman Catholicism except for maybe the pro-life issue or something like that but you have this whole other strand of um, more evangelical more uh, Protestant in terms of their theology but certainly fiercely independent and fundamentalist in terms of their ecclesiology these sorts of churches too will also charge the denominations the Protestant denominations um, with a, a, a falsehood, a violating of Holy Scripture. And they would probably point to a text like 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's listen to a piece of this here, where Paul is talking to the Corinthians and he says, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And so Paul goes on there then to admonish the Corinthians for that kind of fracturing within that particular local congregation. Now, one thing I'll say here is I, I want to call cap a little bit on the use of that text because Paul is not necessarily uh, arguing against the, the wisdom of churches uniting together for the sake of the good of the whole as, as much as Paul is complaining that one particular local congregation is fracturing into splinter groups. And so if that's your best text, independent, fundamentalist, non-denominational churches, I don't think you have the context right there because Paul, again, is talking to division within one local church, not necessarily whether or not Christians should unite in terms of broader groups or fellowships or federations or things like that between churches. So let's get into this topic a little bit today. Um, if you're new to this channel, what's up? My name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship Presbyterian Church. Just to be completely honest with you, we are part of a Protestant denomination, a, a historically reformed Presbyterian denomination. We're part of the PCA, which in my view is a very solid and good, faithful Christian denomination. Sure, we have our issues. All of them do. Uh, but but mo for the most part, I think being a part of the PCA is a delightful and kind of a wonderful thing. And, and so, in fact, what I'm going to argue in this video is that being a part of a Christian denomination is actually a really good thing. Now, I know if you're Catholic or if you're independent, fundamentalist, non-denominational, or just even non-denominational without the independent and the fundamentalist, just give me a moment. Hear me out here. I, I do think that we have something special in terms of the Protestant denominations. First of all, let me respond briefly to the Roman Catholics. Um, in as much as I love the idea of a world global communion, there's no way that we could ever be a part of the Roman Catholic Church. After all, while they blame us for uh, schismaticism in the Protestant Reformation, 
the Roman Catholic Church might want to look back to 1054 um, when the church split east and west over a doctrinal issue. Protestants did not invent schism. Okay, uh, schism had already existed well before Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church. Moreover, there's no way that the Roman Catholic Church is going to be able to unite the world's Christians around a number of their doctrines, which many, many, many Bible-believing, Christ-exalting Christians would see as heresy. I mean by that, we're not going to begin praying to the saints anytime soon. We're not going to begin praying to Mary anytime soon. We're not going to implement the use of icons or we might call them idols into our worship services. Certainly, we would greatly debate with you about your concept of the treasury of merits and justification by grace through faith alone, which Roman Catholic Church did anathematize in the Council of Trent. So, look, there's no way that the Roman Catholic Church is going to be successful in calling churches back into one uh, one global denomination as long as those doctrinal errors and heresies persist. It's just not going to happen. At the same time, I don't think that the independent fundamentalist or the non-denominational churches, however those circles overlap in your Venn diagram, I don't think it's wise to remain independent either. In fact, independency, if anything, cries out, we can't get along with any other church on the face of planet Earth. And don't you think that's like intrinsically problematic? Of course it is. Independence, as an ecclesiastical structure, has no accountability. This is where we get the, the Mark Driscolls of the world who just are all over the place with their own contrived authority. This is where we get actually a lot of false teaching with no accountability. Nobody to call them uh, to account for what they've done. No cooperation among churches. How can you say that that's, uh, that that's better than what a, a good, solid Protestant denomination has? How can you point to... 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and say we as those who were part of denominations are guilty of following Cephas or Apollos or Paul when in fact independent or non-denominational churches have no fellowship with with anybody else no shared doctrine no sharing of resources so I don't think that's a viable option either so if we can't be Roman Catholic and join a global communion for doctrinal issues and we can't be independent and non-denominational for, non-denominational for ecclesiastical reasons, then what is the best option? Let me argue in this video then that the best, most reasonable option is actually to take up league with other like-minded churches, finding as much biblical unity as is reasonably possible. Let's look at the New Testament church for a few moments, shall we? And I, I want you to just consider here again, maybe for the first time, let's just try to be objective thinkers here. What did the New Testament early Christian church do well? Now, we know that they did a lot of things that were not great. That's why Paul is constantly writing letters like 1 Corinthians to correct the churches when they go wrong. So let's not think of the first century as a golden era in which everything was perfect. My goodness, just read any one of the epistles of Paul and you're going to see that there are problems. Even in his letter to the Philippians, you've still got Judea and Syntyche that are arguing. So, so it's, it wasn't a golden era of churchly or ecclesiastical perfection. However, they did do a number of things very, very well. And so we should commend the early church for those things and... I would argue we should model our own churches after the helpful pattern of the first century biblical New Testament churches. Let me mention seven things really quickly that I think they did well. And you might find that these actually start to look like denominational activities. First, they sent missionaries all over the place. Now, it's obvious if you begin to read the epistles and if you begin to read the book of Acts in chapter 13, the church at Antioch begins to send out missionaries, Paul and Barnabas and Mark and, and later on Silas and others. But have you ever noticed that throughout the correspondences in the New Testament that there are certain names that keep coming up over and over again that seem to have connections across a multiplicity of churches? So you've got Paul You've got Timothy referred to in a bunch of different letters, right, including the, the Timothy letters. Well, obviously, he wrote those to Timothy, but you've got him mentioned in a number of different letters. Even the book of Hebrews, you've got people like Barnabas, you've got people like Priscilla and Aquila mentioned in a number of letters across various churches. Just pause and ask yourself, what's going on here? 
what's going on here is that the churches of the New Testament were sharing their resource to, resources to send out missionaries into the global harvest field. And that's exactly what a good denomination does. It pools its resources together to take some of its best and most talented, most zealous evangelists and put them out into the places where uh, they need to go in order to preach the gospel. And so if a denomination exists for anything, it should exist for the sending out of global missionaries. Now, not only that, but when we look at the New Testament church, it's clear that they are meeting together. We might even call it a presbytery or a synod or a general assembly to discuss doctrine. If you don't believe that, just look at Acts chapter 15, where they call the Jerusalem Council. Now today, we have presbyteries and councils and synods and other such meetings to discuss the doctrinal controversies and moral outrages of our day. Yes, we need to do that. Sometimes things come up and we have to get together, the church, and discuss these things and seek out the face of God and pray and, and uh, forge a direction in order to respond to these things. In Acts chapter 15, there's a major doctrinal problem in the church. It's the problem of the Judaizers who are claiming that circumcision and other of the, of the Jewish laws are necessary, necessary as preconditions for salvation. And so what do they do in Acts chapter 15? Well, they call together the elders from various churches and the apostles and they pray and they debate and Peter speaks up and they come to a conclusion based on the will and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And then they send out that directive to the other churches as a, the decision of the whole. Now, if that doesn't sound like a denominational meeting, I don't know what does. Now, my independent fundamentalist and non-denominational friends, I don't know who you would gather with when such a controversy comes, because if you're so fiercely independent that you look left and you look right and you look forward and you look back and you have no friends on the Christian landscape intentionally by your own decision, who then would you seek out help from? I don't think that's possible. Not only that, but clearly the New Testament churches are corresponding with one another, which is another one of the things that a good denomination does. Uh, they're sending out letters, right? So Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, to the churches, plural, in Galatia. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before, but it's not the church singular. It's not one local congregation in Galatia. It's the churches, plural, in the region of Galatia. Galatia is not a city like Ephesus or Corinth or Philippi. Galatia is an area. And so here, it seems pretty obvious that the letter to the Galatians is meant to be shared throughout the other churches in that area of Galatia. Not only that, we see the same thing happening at the end of the Colossian letter where it's specifically exhorted that they would share that letter with the Laodicean church. Same thing in the book of Revelation, which I'm preaching through right now. It's a, it's a letter, although it's apocalyptic in its genre, but it's a letter that's meant to be sent out through the seven churches in Asia Minor. And interestingly, even as John names them, they're in the very order of the route that you would take that letter to. And so it's very clear then that the New Testament churches were corresponding with one another very, very regularly. Not only that, but they're clearly sharing financial resources, which is a fourth thing that a good denomination does. It shares financial resources. They've got various fundraisers that they're working on, believe it or not. Uh, it's pretty clear that the Philippians are supporting Paul, even though he doesn't come from the Philippian church originally. Uh, the Corinthians, they've got some issues with Paul when it comes to finances, but the Corinthians are also supporting the Jerusalem poor, right? So look at 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. So obviously they're helping each other out in terms of, again, sending out missionaries, but also supporting one another in their various projects of care and compassion and other such ministries. Next and fifth, they're ordaining together. So Paul says that in, in Titus chapter one, that they are to ordain elders in every town, okay? And in 1 Timothy chapter four, verse 14, he refers to the council of elders that laid their hands on you, Timothy, to ordain you. So ordination is properly the work, not just of one local church. And here I'm gonna argue against my independent fundamentalists and especially Baptistic churches here. Um, the idea that one local congregation does all of the work of ordaining, I don't think we can root that in scripture. It seems pretty clear here that ordination is the function of the presbyters or the elders from the regional body of churches. And so ordination is another, another proper function of a good, solid Christian denomination. One of the reasons why that is so is because men that are to be ordained are to be examined by 
their fellow under shepherds in the Lord. And so in the Presbyterian Church, of course, we have a quite intricate process for examining, testing, and then ultimately ordaining new pastors within our congregations. So six, then, we share the same form of government. And this is obvious, too, when we look at the New Testament churches. Uh, there is an ecclesiastical model that is presented in the New Testament. Um, some may not agree with us, but it seems pretty clear that the New Testament churches, uh, they had apostles, which that office has obviously uh, gone out, right? Because apostles were those who were specifically commissioned and ordained by Jesus, who were the founders of the early churches and had apostolic authority to write New Testament letters and things like this. They also had to have seen the risen Christ, which is now impossible because Christ has been raised and is seated at the right hand of the Father. So th there are no apostles today. However, Jesus does commission uh, that there would be elders and that there would be deacons in the local church and that the elders would be those who rule and those who labor in preaching and teaching. We see that distinction in Paul's letters as well. And so the New Testament church has sh shared the same form of church government. And that's another thing then that a good Protestant denomination would share. And then finally, seventhly, we share orthopraxy and orthodoxy. That is to say, <clears throat> right solid doctrine and right solid practice within the church. This is why Paul writes the letter to the Corinthians, because he needs to correct them not only in their theology, right? First Corinthians 15 on the resurrection, but also he needs to correct them in terms of their own church discipline with the person who is guilty of sexual immorality. And he needs to correct their practice when it comes to the Lord's table. And so if you were completely independent, fundamentalist, non-denominational, who would be out there to correct you or to help you or even to support you in terms of faithful doctrine and faithful practice? So when you really you look at the New Testament churches um, in the Bible, in the New Testament, it seems pretty obvious that those seven marks are actually the same seven marks of a good, healthy, Protestant, evangelical, Bible-believing denomination. Again, let me just go through those again real quick. They sent missionaries. They met for doctrine. They sent letters and corresponded to one another. They shared financial resources. They pooled together in terms of the ordination process. They shared the same church government. And they corrected one another in terms of orthodoxy and orthopraxy. And so with that being said, here's what I would say would be some good recommendations then in terms of this, this topic. First, we should have, or let's call this A, we should have as much visible and tangible unity within the body of Christ as is possible. Now, again, if you're non-denominational and your motto is, we don't get along with anyone, which that's exactly what the title means, right? Non-denominational, we don't take any names. In other words, we, we have no fellowship with nobody. We sit down at the table with ourselves only. That just doesn't display the visible unity of the church. Now, again, Roman Catholicism could never be a part of it because of all of its errors and, and heresies and false doctrines and false teaching and anathematizing of, of the true biblical gospel could never be a part of that, but we should have as much visible, tangible unity as possible. And so even if you belong to a non-denominational church right now, that doesn't mean you couldn't start striving towards that. I mean, maybe there are some conferences that you could participate in. Maybe there's some help ministries. Maybe there's some local charitable ministries that you could be a part of. Maybe even pastors groups meeting together to begin acting out some sort of uh, visible unity within your body. I think that should be true, especially amongst local congregations in the same area, okay? That's one thing if you've got another church in Seattle that has kind of similar doctrine to you and maybe your friends on Facebook, but but there's a there's a real powerful, and by the way, why, why would you have anything in common with Seattle, right? Just kidding. Just kidding, West Coasters. Um, but there's a real powerful unity that local churches can have together, especially when they're kind of rooting out scoundrels and charlatans that try to make their way from church to church in the same area. A lot of us have had this happen where certain personalities, they try to work their way into a local church and then they cause disaster. And what do they do? They go down to the next local church and they they get in there and they behave for six months and then they cause chaos there. And even charlatan pastors Especially this is rife in non-denominational churches. They move from one place to the next to the next, causing chaos and havoc everywhere they go. 
local churches need to do as much as possible to prevent these kinds of things. And I think that denominations that uh, there are churches that are part of denominations, they should try as much as possible to even have unity with other denominations. Let me give you an example. Of course, my example is going to come uh, most close to heart here with, with our own church. So we're Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are part of Ascension Presbytery, which is a regional body of uh, 16, 17, something like that churches in our area. Keep each other accountable. We meet for worship. We share the Lord's Supper together. Uh, we pool resources. We're trying to plant a church. We send out missionaries, do all this kind of thing together. But then our presbytery is linked with 88 other presbyteries to form the PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America. Now, as it has it, our denomination also tries to cooperate with other denominations. And so we're part of something called NAPARC, in which there are 13 other reformed denominations. Now we're talking some pretty serious unity across not only church lines, but also denominational lines. We work together with other NAPARC churches to do other things like, again, planting churches together. And then we're even part of a bigger communion called the World Reformed Fellowship. And so I think as much unity as we can possibly display is to the good. Now, next, um, if it's in any way possible, and I'm probably preaching into the wind here, if it were any way possible for denominations to merge together from time to time, that is a very beautiful and winsome thing. Also displaying that unity within the body of Christ. I can give you one historic example. Um, the PCA, that's my denomination, they merged with another denomination called the RPC, R RPCES in 1982 to form a new denomination. We, we called it Joining and Receiving. So these two denominations actually merged together and now exist in a peaceful um, unity together as one. It's a beautiful thing. Wish that happened more often. Unfortunately, you know, the Roman Catholics, they do have a point. We tend to fracture and splinter more than we join. And so we should be trying to find any kind of unity between denominations. I know John Frame used to talk about that a lot. I don't think anybody listened to him, but he was always arguing that Presbyterian denominations should join and merge whenever possible. And then, uh, you know, if none of these things are realistic for you and for your congregation, I do see a great value in ministerial associations. I'm not really part of one here right now because of my work in the Presbytery of Ascension. It's kind of, uh, kind of demanding Presbytery in terms of our time and effort. Most PCA Presbyteries are. But when I was down in Brooksville, Florida, um, our presbytery was the whole state. And so it was much harder for us to meet together as local congregations because... Well, Ascension Presbytery here is really just a quadrant of the state of Pennsylvania. So all the churches are within a couple hours, a lot of them 45 minutes or an hour. But in Florida, we had the whole Caribbean as well as the whole state of Florida. It's pretty hard to get together. So we had a very excellent ministerial association in the town of Brooksville in which we got together Presbyterians and Lutherans and Methodists and some non-denominational guys and some Pentecostal guys and we would meet together regularly for lunch and for a devotion and we talk about our various church struggles and then we even had um, some prayer services national day of prayer things like that which we would lead for the sake of the community and believe it or not it was incredibly peaceful we didn't argue very often at all <laughs> it was a really amazing thing so look i guess the whole point here is um, i don't agree with the roman catholics for various doctrinal reasons uh, I dismiss their charges against us of dividing the body of Christ, fracturing it and splintering it into 10,000 pieces because we experience in the Reformed uh, community a ton of Christian unity across churches, presbyteries, and even denominations. And not only that, I, I do reject then the kind of independent fundamentalist spirits of many churches that say, I can't cooperate with anybody. Nobody's good enough to join us at the table. I just think that's mean-spirited and, and not, not helpful. All right, well, that's my plea for Christian unity. Thank you so much for checking in today. Uh, do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later. See ya.